Hi, I'm Pete McCall, and welcome to episode 79 of All About Fitness. As you might be able to tell, I'm kind of fighting a little cold, and my voice is a little scratchy, and I've been in a really good role of getting these podcasts out. So instead of taking a little bit of time off to let, it, let my voice heal or just to get better, I wanted to put out today's podcast because it's a very special guest. Now, it's been a big trend for the last maybe five to seven years in the fitness industry, but high-intensity interval training has been used for years, going back decades, to produce results for high-end athletes. The thing is, it was never really applied to the general population because it was always thought to be, well, too intense, too much work, or it had a high risk of injury. Well, the, today's guest is a researcher who's been focusing on high-intensity interval training for the better part of his career. Dr. Martin Gabala is a professor and chair of the kinesiology department at McMaster University in Hamilton, Ontario, Canada. Now, Dr. Gabala has been researching high-intensity interval training, not just for performance athletes. That's where most of the work was done for years. How can we use HIT training or interval training to help athletes get better at their, at their sport? But what Martin has been doing is he's been looking at high-intensity interval training for you, for the average, for the general population. Is HIT training effective for the fat loss? Is HIT training effective for fighting chronic disease like diabetes? So on this episode of All About Fitness, it's my pleasure to introduce Dr. Martin Gabala. And after a brief word from the sponsor of All About Fitness, we'll be discussing the high intensity interval training and how it can help you improve your health, lose weight, and achieve a variety of different goals. Vicore Fitness is the maker of the new TerraCore, which is a step, bench, balance trainer, a multifaceted exercise tool combined into one single platform. Go to vicorefitness.com to see the newest piece of equipment that will be taking the fitness industry by storm in 2017. Use the code AAF to save 20% on purchasing a TerraCore of your own. TerraCore by Vicor Fitness. Vicor Fitness. Better results from better products. I'm Pete McCall with All About Fitness. I'm on the phone today or on the line today with Dr. Martin Gabala out of Canada. Um, Marty, can you give us a little bit of background about what it is that you do and kind of the work that you've been doing? Uh, sure. I'm a professor and the chair of the kinesiology department at McMaster University. We're in Hamilton, which is about an hour outside of Toronto. Uh, I've been here for about uh, 17 years. Uh, I teach uh, and conduct research uh, related to the body's adaptations to exercise. Uh, we do both applied human performance studies and we do very basic molecular work looking at how skeletal muscle responds to the, to the stress of exercise. And how did you get interested in the first place? I mean, were you an athlete growing up or what, what, was your, what, what kind of uh, sparked your interest in exercise science? Yeah, probably like a lot of people get into kinesiology, played a lot of different sports, was hardly an expert at any of those. But uh, I, I almost went, I, I was accepted into university to be an architect and sort of changed my mind at the last minute because in my last year of high school, I got into triathlons. And so kinesiology sounded like a neat fit. Uh, but that's how I started. Uh, really fell in love with human physiology and just progressed from there. Uh, how I got into interval training was... Uh, I, I used to teach, and I still teach to this day, a course called the Integrative Physiology of Human Performance. All of my students are fascinated by the training regimes of elite athletes. And, you know, you go back to the turn of the century, and there were elite middle distance runners winning Olympic gold medals, training only exclusively uh, using short, hard intervals. And at the time, I was a busy young assistant professor with a uh, working wife, young kids, and quite ironically, for a professor of exercise physiology, found myself with little time to work out. And so I started adopting some interval training programs of, of my own and, and found them to be quite effective. So it's, it's really been a professional and personal interest. And over time, I've, I've just gained more of an appreciation for both the athletic and the scientific history of interval training. Well, and, and you book, your, your book, The One Minute Workouts, does a great job of kind of covering some of the history of interval training. Why do you think it is? Why do you think athletes, if it was so successful a number of years ago, why do you think athletes, especially here in the West and primarily the United States, why do you think they moved away from that type of training if it, if it demonstrates success? Yeah, great question. And it's sort of, if you look at the history, it goes in and out of flavor, as you allude to. And I think part of it, it's just that um, approaches to training differ over time. Uh, you know, it's... <laughs> 
you can have a very good debate around some athletes. Are they successful in spite of their training or because of their training? And most of these elite athletes are experiments of, of one. And so, you know, could certain world records be a little bit better if that individual had trained a little bit different? We're not really sure. But, you know, I, I think the bottom line is that interval training has come in and out of flavor at, at, at varying times. Uh, and certainly, you know, in the early seventies and that for, uh, distance running, uh, it was all about volume, uh, certainly with a lot of the American runners. Uh, and then of course it's, uh, the tide turns, uh, a little bit as, as you go through. So I don't really have the answer other than different fads and approaches, uh, come in and out of flavor over time. And, uh, you know, we really have to look to our history to, uh, to understand that. Well, and you do a great job of covering the history of what the Canadian military did. And isn't it, I mean, do you find it ironic now that, that kind of some of the militaries are coming back to what Canada originally did? But how long was it, about 40, 50 years ago? I, I just love that story. So, yeah, there was uh, this, this individual named Bill Orban, who was a hockey player from the Canadian prairies. Uh, and he went to the U.S. on a hockey scholarship, and he eventually got his Ph.D., and the Canadian military, the Royal Canadian Air Force, this was in the uh, the, the height of the Cold War in the, the, the mid-50s. Uh, you know, you had these Canadian pilots stationed in the far Arctic, and they basically sat around all day and were quite sedentary. And so the irony is that they're supposed to be protecting the fate of the free world. And yet at a time, fully one third of Canadian pilots were deemed so out of shape, they were unfit to fly. And so Orban came up with this program called 5BX for five basic exercises. Uh, a colleague of mine says it was just P90X without the marketing. Uh, but, you know, it was <coughs> these body weight style exercises, calisthenic type child style training that you could do anywhere. And he found it to be very effective at getting these soldiers back into shape. And the program really spread from there beyond the military and over 20 million pamphlets of, of five BX have, uh, have subsequently been published. But I just love the great story because, you know, a little bit of Canadiana, uh, and, and, and uh, this hockey player, because, you know, hockey, uh, sort of epitomizes these short, hard workouts and interval training, I think has uh, a lot of applications in, in team sport as well. Well, it's, it's interesting that you mentioned that Marty, because a friend of mine, uh, from Edmonton, actually, he, uh, created a, a product based on his training with, uh, hockey players. His friend uh, was a strength coach, I think, with the Canucks in Vancouver. I might be maybe the Oilers. I think I think Benny worked with the Oilers, but I don't know if you know if you've crossed paths with Michal Dalcourt. Um, but Michal developed something called the Viper because he saw that hockey players that worked on the farm all summer were less injury were less injury prone than kids that worked in the gyms all all during the summer. And so he created the Vipers, basically like a bale of hay to do different movements in in the gym instead of just linear movements. Yeah, a lot of this, you know, functional strength training, of course, has its uh, roots. In, you know, interval. people say, is interval training a fad? And I say, well, not really, because I, I, I think it's more an approach, you know, and you can apply intervals to functional uh, whole body resistance exercise. You can apply it in a cardio manner. So I think it's just more an approach to exercise as opposed to being a specific type of exercise. And it's certainly not a fad, in my opinion. No, not at all. And for people that have been doing this for a while, I mean, we know because how do how do elite um, athletes, elite runners train? You know, people training from the 100 to the 400, they train in intervals. And, and, you know, when you look at their physique, they're not training physique. They're training for performance. You know, so I think is there something we can learn from from looking at that type of high intensity training? No, I, I think so. Clearly, if you want to be an elite, uh, you know, short distance athlete or sprinter, intervals are essential. But for any serious endurance athlete, they're going to be incorporating intervals uh, as well. And so it's a technique that I think can just be widely applied from a performance standpoint uh, to, to almost anyone. And of course, you know, there, there's, when I talk about interval training, there's sort of three approaches. One is like, what's new here. Athletes have been doing it for a hundred years. And certainly there's a lot of elite strength coaches and performance coaches, you know, that have been adopting these principles. Uh, the other side of the coin is, oh my God, this is a heart attack waiting to happen. You can't do this at all. And sort of the middle reasonable ground approach is, oh, there, maybe there's some new stuff here, but we should also learn from, uh, from, from our history. But in some ways, you know, the scientists play catch up. The athletes are already doing things that they find works. They can't really explain why. And then the scientists come and sort of explain the mechanisms, but often are just reinforcing 
uh, what some individuals uh, already knew. Don't you find that somewhat ironic as, as a professor that, that it, there's a kind of a chicken and the egg when it comes to, to exercise science, that you, you'll see something become popular in a gym or become a popular fitness trend, and then the researchers will come along and then try to understand that. Is that, do you, in your lab, do you try to kind of just go after stuff that interests you, or do you see main stuff that's gone mainstream and then try to explain why it's working or what's happening in the body um, from doing that type of exercise? No, we, I guess we study questions that are of interest to us. And, you know, I'll often say, I used to be able to say, look, I have no vested interest in this. And if interval training didn't work, we would have moved on a long time ago. You know, now, of course, I've written a book that tries to explain it. And so at least there's uh, that that link there. So, I, you know, I, I can't say I have no vested interest anymore. Um, but the, the we ask questions that are of interest to us. Sometimes we'll do some product testing or industry-sponsored research. But really, most of our research is just intellectual, curiosity-driven uh, research. And I'm just fascinated by interval training because we can use it to study basic mechanisms of skeletal muscle adaptation, and we can apply it in a you know very real world setting to individuals with type 2 diabetes and track their blood sugar responses in, in real time. So I, I sort of like it for both the basic and applied clinical research that we can conduct using this, you know, this single tool, if you will. Well, and as I mentioned, um, yeah, I did come across your name a number of years ago when I used some of your studies uh, to support some stuff I was doing in, in some uh, a couple of workshops I was creating for fitness educators. Now, let's let's go in because I think one of my fears, uh, Marty, is, is that people have kind of taken the concept of interval training and just like all Americans do, and I'll say this is a, a uniquely American trait, we take a little bit of, so, of something that's really good and we think a lot more of it will be better. So what is really, what's, when it comes to interval training, what's more important? Is it duration or is it intensity? And, and how can we explain that? Yeah, to my mind, intensity trumps duration. And I'm sure we'll get into that a little bit. But, you know, let's even start with a definition of interval training, which is just really alternating periods of more intense effort with periods of recovery. Uh, I think people have this notion that interval training is only this all out extreme as hard as you can go exercise certainly that's one type and it can be extremely efficient but it's not necessarily safe or suitable for anyone uh, or everyone rather at the other end of the spectrum is interval walking uh, so uh, if your only exercise is walking around the block picking up the pace for a few light posts and then backing off that can be an interval workout for you, and that type of work has been shown to be actually more effective at boosting fitness, improving blood sugar control in people with diabetes. So interval training really spans the gamut, and I think some people uh, almost want to uh, corrupt it, if you will, and say it's only like this. And then I think that's where some of the uh, the pushback comes uh, because people are like, wait a minute, that is crazy. We, you know, we wouldn't want anyone just sort of jumping off a the couch and, and pedaling their hearts out on a bike, for example. And, and is that, and, and that was one of the questions I was going to ask. I mean, obviously that we know that, that intensity is critically important, but can somebody start, I mean, if somebody is having, isn't really working out now, can they start interval training with just doing a little bit more than they're used to doing? I, I do think someone could start with, with intervals. And again, I would say these, these gentle intervals. So of course, you know, th you, you want to build gradually, but I, I would make the point that, you know, interval training has been applied in a cardiac rehabilitation setting um, for decades, uh, you, you know, and, and it, this is where you look at the scientific history and you learn, but certainly there was immense work being conducted in Germany in the mid-1980s, work in North America even before that, but looking at uh, interval training in a cardiac rehabilitation setting, so people coming in after a heart attack and then using interval workouts uh, to, uh, to, to build fitness from there. And the point we tell this story in the book, uh, for some of these individuals, they just can't do continuous exercise at almost any level. And so rather than being afraid of intervals, it sort of reframe it a little bit, because if you look at these individuals, they get out of their car, they take a few steps in the parking lot, and then they have to stop and take a break. Then they, then they walk a little bit more. They're basically doing interval training because they have to. It's the only way that they can, they can function. And so when you sort of flip how you think about it, it's not as perhaps you know, crazy to think that interval training can be applied to very deconditioned individuals. It's all about how you, how you scale it. And, and I'll come back to that in a second because I want to ask, let's talk a little bit about what's going on physiologically with interval training, because I think a lot of times 
we, we fall back to the marker of simply heart rate. And, and there are a couple very popular modes of exercise or companies promoting a heart rate based. But let's look at what, what's exactly is happening to the body from an energetic standpoint, from the, from the metabolic standpoint, when we do a high intensity interval. Yeah, well, for, you know, maybe we can dispel the notion that HIT is anaerobic exercise because it's not. You know, if you do a single hard sprint, <coughs> most of the energy is going to come from anaerobic sources or non oxidative sources. But if you do repeated sprints or any form of intermittent exercise, the vast majority is coming from the aerobic system. Uh, there's lots of studies demonstrating that in the laboratory. So to, to characterize HIT as anaerobic training uh, is wrong. Uh, and so once you understand that interval exercise uh, largely uh, utilizes aerobic uh, metabolism, it's perhaps not surprising that it can be such a potent stimulus to elicit aerobic adaptation. So your heart becomes a better, stronger pump, your blood vessels get more elastic at delivering oxygen and your muscles get better at, at using those, the oxygen that gets, uh, delivered. So, uh, again, there's some common, I think, misconceptions about interval training that are really important to, uh, to dispel. Now is one of the benefits of, of interval training, it, you know, we use the energy, energy substrates. It, is it, you know, you deplete through the glycogen, the, the available glycogen, the type two fibers. So is one of the benefits of interval training, like how our body processes carbohydrates and you know why is that why is that beneficial for us uh yes yeah. so you know getting back to the basic physiology uh the the underlying molecular cellular pathways uh are, are quite similar and and just that we trigger them in different ways so the analogy we use in the book is one of the ways uh that you can trigger adaptation so let's talk about glycogen or carbohydrate as you alluded to there is you can sort of step on the gas pedal and hold it there for a prolonged period of time. And so fuels in the muscle slowly start to decline. The body senses that. There's literally proteins in the muscle cell that serve as molecular fuel gauges. So they sense that decline in fuel and they respond and adapt. Uh, with intervals, you can imagine you're stepping on the gas pedal harder, in some cases pushing it right to the floor, but holding it there for just a very short period of time. And so there, fuel gauges in the muscles are dropping very rapidly. And so the body appears to be able to respond to these rapid changes in fuel status as well, uh, even though it takes less time and trigger the same fundamental uh, remodeling. And so some of your work, and you mentioned this a little bit earlier, but why is that beneficial for, for people dealing with diabetes, whether it's onset diabetes, well, primarily onset diabetes, due to, you know, due to being overweight or due to lack of activity, why would this type of interval training kind of help counteract the, what's happening, what's going on with the body in, re, in relation to that? Yeah, so one of the adaptations in muscle is the muscle's ability to take up blood sugar uh, is enhanced. So there's these uh, proteins on the muscle cell, glucose transporters, uh, and we know that one of the benefits of exercise for blood sugar control is that the muscle cells get better at basically mopping up or sucking up this glucose or blood sugar, uh, getting it into the muscles and either storing it as glycogen or, or breaking it down. And we've shown in, for example, people with type 2 diabetes, even if they do a few sessions of interval training over a couple of weeks, uh, the glucose transport capacity in their muscles uh, is markedly elevated. So uh, again, we can show at the molecular level some of the adaptations that we think is related to the functional outcomes or the clinical changes that you're seeing uh, in, in these individuals. And I just want to I want to highlight um, you know, what you said there for a second, because, you know, I think, well, you said we think, you know, and we don't really definitively know. Even when you study the human body, we don't really develop a definitive knowledge, do we? But we develop a really good kind of estimated guess, correct? Yeah, you know, these theory, I, 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 I'll tell my students that, you know, individual scientific, it's, it's a bit like building a house. You know, these bricks can look very, very different. And so with a single scientific study, you can say almost anything. But then after a while, the, the shape of the house starts to take shape as, as more bricks are added. Uh, and so you can think of that in, in any scientific theory, more and more bricks are being added. And I, I think that, you know, the interval house, if you will, is is fairly firmly established now. We still have things to learn, but I think we can clearly say that one, intervals can be a time efficient way to elicit adaptations that we associate with more traditional exercise training. Um, and also if you can compare 
equal amounts of exercise. So a given dose of exercise, uh, I, I think more intense exercise uh, is uh, is better and is going to elicit superior adaptations on sort of a an apples to apples comparison or matched work basis. Well, and do you think because I think one of the reasons why people many people start fitness programs and we're coming up on the beginning of the year, so this is going to be a hot topic for the next number of weeks. But I think one of the reasons why people start fitness programs is to improve muscular definition. Does interval training do a good, just high intensity interval training, how does it, how does it help boost muscle definition? Doesn't it activate more type 2 fibers related to the size and definition of muscles? Yeah, I guess a couple points there. Yes, for sure. Um, interval exercise does recruit or stimulate these type 2 muscle fibers, and so they respond and, and adapt. Uh, if you want those fibers to grow or hypertrophy, uh, you, of course, have to apply a resistance exercise stress, either through weightlifting exercise or bodyweight style training. Uh, cardio intervals on a bike, for example, aren't going to do a whole lot for, for hypertrophy. Um, you know, intervals, personal trainers talk about the afterburn or this idea of a heightened metabolic rate in, in recovery. Uh, it's often overstated, but it's real. So when you do more intense exercise or intervals, uh, the, the rate of calorie burning in recovery is definitely up uh, for a period of time compared to more continuous, moderate exercise. Um, and so intervals, you know, like any exercise can support weight loss. Um, but clearly the biggest driver there is, uh, is nutrition, whether it's 90, 10 or 80, 20, we could debate, but, uh, you know, it's a lot easier to control the energy inside of the equation when we're talking about uh, body mass, body composition. So, so that, that kind of comes back to that statement that, that abs for people that are interested in that abs are made in the kitchen, correct? <laughs> yeah, ab absolutely. Yeah. Cause I think, I think a lot of people will sometimes they look to, they, you know, they start an exercise program, think it's going to change everything. Um, and then if they don't change their diet or don't change other habits, then it's not really going to change that much at all, unfortunately. Now, uh, let me ask you, is it safe for, for people that, that get into their 40s, 50s, 60s, for people that get a little bit more mature, to use that term, is interval training safe for them? And is high-intensity interval training um, itself safe for, for people throughout the aging process? Yeah, so a couple of key points here. And the first, I'd come back to this idea that interval training is infinitely variable. And so it ranges from interval walking to short, all-out maximal sprints. So that'd be point number one. Point number two is interval training has been widely applied now to individuals, older individuals into their 80s, uh, individuals with type 2 diabetes, metabolic syndrome, obese individuals, uh, heart disease patients, uh, and shown to be beneficial. Uh, now, that being said, at an individual level, it's important to see your doctor uh, to assess any potential underlying risk factors uh, that, that you may have. So, you know, again, at the individual level, before you change or begin an exercise uh, regime, it's just common sense to see your doctor and, and get checked. But people don't need to be afraid of, of intervals. You know, we'll read in the paper, certainly in Canada, we'll see these stories, high profile stories of the, the, the beer league hockey player. So the guy in his 40 or 50s, he goes out and plays hockey with his buddies once a week. And occasionally you'll read these tragic stories of an individual who suffers a heart attack and dies on the ice. Of course, very tragic on an individual level. But if you look at the broader epidemiological evidence, it would suggest that even a single weekly bout of exercise is protected <coughs> against your risk of dying from all, all causes. Uh, and so again, at the individual level, get checked, but people don't need to be afraid of high intensity intervals, and they've been applied to many different uh, populations. For the book, I went and talked to some of the leading cardiologists in the US, and the message was just what I said to you. You know, if, if you're an older individual who might have some symptoms, you're not time pressed, start with some moderate exercise. But if your choice is to do high intensity intervals or nothing and just remain completely sedentary, you're much better off doing intervals. And, and I think that's a very important message because and I want, just want to reiterate that, you know, from from being the host of the podcast is that exercise, any exercise is stress on the body. And if you're going to introduce a new exercise program, if you're listening and you're not really haven't been working out for a while, you want to start working out. Interval training is very safe, as, as Marty said, but really it is suggested that before you add a new stressor, Make sure you see a doctor to identify any underlying existing stressors, such as disease that you may not know you have. So I just want to make sure to kind of hit that from a <laughs> from a uh, from a safety standpoint there. Now, with that that said, um, talk a little bit more about EPOC because um, I think I think a lot of people get this m misconception that okay, I just did a hard workout, therefore I'm burning more, more calories. Let me go pick up a frozen coffee drink and a muffin 
on the way home. I mean, so you said EPOC is real, but how much does it account for in the uh, post-exercise um, oxygen consumption? Yeah, so, you know, we've done studies in the lab where we've looked at this. And so, for example, a 20-minute session of intervals may result in the same calorie burn over 24 hours as a 50-minute session of continuous exercise. Now, that, of course, depends on the specific intensity and everything like that. But suffice to say, intervals can be a time-efficient way to burn calories. Um, but there we're talking about maybe 300 calories with each of those uh, workouts in, in, in total. So, you know, when you consider that a donut may have 250 or 300 calories, uh, it speaks to this idea of, you know, the, the energy inside of the equation being uh, important. And so when it comes to afterburn, you know, if you look online, you'll see these massive epochs drawn or these massive amounts of uh, afterburn. It's actually quite small. You know, the, the uh, energy expenditure remains elevated for a, a small amount of time in recovery uh, that, you know, that may last for a couple of hours, but we're literally talking here, you know, 10, 15 calories an hour higher uh, than, than basal metabolic rate. So uh, you can't, uh, it's often overstated. And in fact, the epoch is actually quite small. Um, but these little changes add up over time. You know, if you do the math on a typical individual who gets out of college and perhaps puts on 30 pounds over the next 30 years or so, you do the math and it's maybe a half a teaspoon of sugar uh, a day in terms of the calorie differential. So these small uh, amounts really add up over time, whether it's uh, energy expenditure or, or energy gain. And, and that's, I think that's important for people to realize is that just, and that is one of the biggest benefits is it's net, you need to look at your net energy expenditure during the day. Because I think what we're starting to see is that people can exercise for an hour, but if they spend, you know, the next eight to 10 hours being sedentary, um, that that might counteract the exercise. Is that, is that something that you've noticed or is that something that you've paid attention to in the literature? We're increasingly interested in this idea of exercise snacking, uh, taking some clues from continuous work that's out there. So, for example, there's been studies that have compared uh, 30 minutes of continuous exercise in a single session or three 10-minute bouts of exercise spread through the day. And the evidence, uh, at least the preliminary evidence, would suggest actually the, the exercise snacking or breaking up the workouts through the day may be a little better for you in terms of uh, blood sugar control, in terms of blood pressure control. And it probably relates to what you alluded to there. These prolonged periods of sedentary behavior, prolonged periods of muscle inactivity uh, is, is bad for us. And so now we're starting to look at what if we break up the one-minute workout into even shorter, uh, more frequent bouts of exercise uh, through the day? Do you get the same gains in fitness and, and things like that? Because this concept of exercise snacking, it resonates for a lot of people because it's a lot easier to fit in these shorter, more frequent workouts through the day. And when I say workouts, these are things that can be done anywhere. You know, a set of air squats in your office or, or taking the stairs uh, from, your, from your coffee break. So just sprinkling physical activity into your day more, breaking up these sedentary periods, uh, clearly very beneficial. And, and that's, that's very important for people to hear because I, I think they just need to start making act, more activity a habit, period. I mean, instead of just saving it for an hour a day at the gym, which is great and much better than nothing, but if they can find ways to walk more or just do more activity throughout the day, I think people would be surprised at how quickly they see results. Now, just one or two more questions, um, you know, before we finish up here. Is interval training, are the adaptations specific to the muscles involved, meaning that if you're only doing cycling or you're only doing sprinting, are your upper body muscles receiving any benefit from high-intensity interval training? And is, is that a reason for doing maybe some boxing or some heavy rope work to incorporate the upper body muscles as well? Yeah, boy, that could be a whole podcast. Uh, <laughs> and, and so, you know, generally speaking, uh, if you're a cyclist, you're not getting much adaptation in the muscles of the uh, upper arms, for example. So they're not becoming more uh, uh, aerobic. Uh, but we're increasingly learning more about uh, these systematic factors that may circulate. So, you know, how when we do exercise is our skin more pliant and younger looking. You know, it's related to these circulating factors. Uh, uh, my colleague, Mark Tarnopolsky, talks about exerkines. So basically these hormone-like substances that are released from muscles and may circulate an impact on, on, other, on other tissues. So clearly there's some systemic benefits of exercise, regardless of how we do it, that, that we're learning. Uh, but from a, you know, um, a, a performance uh, standpoint, the, the 
principle of specificity still largely holds. So if you want to be a good cyclist, you got to spend a fair bit of time uh, cycling. There's some trade-off there, you know, in the old phrase that your heart doesn't know what your muscles are doing is, is also true. So you can get cardiovascular benefit, whether you're doing cycling or swimming or running or elliptical, uh, but for sports specific training or for performance adaptations, I think this, the, the specificity principle uh, still holds. And, and that's, an, again, that's an, just an important message to reinforce. Now, now, finally, you know, your workouts that you promote are, are relatively short. And since reading your book, you know, picking it up and reading it and, and preparing for this, I've just been playing around at the gym with a couple different intervals, 30, 30, um, meaning 30 seconds really hard and 30 seconds relatively easy, and then 30, 20, 10, meaning 30 easy, 20 moderate, and 10 really an all-out effort. And is some people might not believe that doing only 5 to 10 minutes of that can provide benefits, but but that's the case, right? Just doing short intervals, as long as they're high intensity, really can provide, you don't need to go that long. 10, 12 minutes would be more than enough to provide a good workout, correct? Without question. You know, where the title of the book, The One Minute Workout, comes from, it's from studies where we've had people do three 20-second bursts of very hard exercise. Now, that's normally set within a 10-minute total time commitment, including warm-up, cool-down, and some recovery periods. But we've shown that people who do those three 10-minute sessions a week um, can get the same benefits, at least over a couple of months, as people doing 150 minutes per week of continuous moderate exercise. So we're talking here the boost in their cardio fitness, the improvements in their blood sugar control, and even some of the changes, the molecular changes in muscle, even though the interval trainers are doing five-fold less uh, time commitment. So unquestionably, these short, hard intervals can be very effective. It's not the only way to train. It's not for everyone. Uh, responses are highly individualized, but short, hard workouts can be very, very effective to elicit the adaptations we associate with a more traditional approach. And then how many times a week? I mean, what's your recommendation, especially for somebody in their 40s or 50s? It's it's not something they should do every day. I mean, could they do it every day or how should they structure and allow for, for recovery from the workouts? Yeah, you know, most of our studies have people doing intervals three times a week. I, I think variety is best, right? So at the individual, you know, I, I'm someone, I, clearly I like intervals, but I still like to go for a walk with my dog in the woods, right? So it's variety is best. Um, you know, I'll, I'll, it's like it's like investing your money. Uh, you can buy one stock and maybe hit a home run or it might go bust as well. And so the, the best approach is spread out the risk a little bit or use a varied approach to investing because that's probably going to be your best payoff in, in the long term and, and minimize uh, risk of, of nothing happening. So I, I think when it comes to exercise, it's much the same approach. Um, you know, but it, now if you're someone who absolutely hates intervals uh, and you find them very uncomfortable, I can talk to them blue in the face and you're not going to adopt it. So maybe continuous moderate exercise is best for you. Uh, at the other end of the spectrum, there's some very busy type A time pressed executives who do their training almost exclusively using intervals and it works for them. So it's, it's highly individualized and I think a varied approach to fitness is always going to be your best bet. The best exercise for you, something you like, enjoy, because you're more likely to stick with it over the long term. And that, that's such an important message. Well, uh, Martin Gabala is a PhD out of and you're at McMaster University in Canada? Correct. Okay. He's the author of one, The One Minute Workout, How Science Shows a Way to Get Fit That's Smarter, Faster, Shorter. Yeah, Marty, I've been reading your stuff for years. It really is a, a pleasure to finally speak with you in person and uh, to catch up with you a little bit, to learn a little more about HIT training. Um, any final thoughts just about on, on finding – do you have a favorite style? I mean, do you have – you talk about walk, going for walks with your dogs, but when you're in the gym – do you prefer bike, treadmill? What type of equipment do you like? Yeah, so I, uh, I, I used to be a track runner, and, and so now I'm almost 50. I have uh, knee arthritis, and, and so uh, cycling is my go-to cardio exercise. Uh, I'm still able to skate, and so later on today, I'm going to head to my uh, weekly pickup hockey game with uh, some of the uh, other faculty members here at McMaster. So I try to take a varied approach to fitness. I rarely go to the gym, and that's because uh, I basically have set up a power rack in my basement. I find it works for me, right? Uh, I have kids, busy life like a lot of other people. So for me, uh, having a, a go-to exercise of cycling indoors during long Canadian winters, uh, outdoor on the trails near my house in the summer, sprinkle that in with uh, some, some lifting and bodyweight style stuff, and uh, that's what it, I find works for me. Awesome. Excellent. Well, Martin Gabala, thank you for your time, and I look forward to catching up with you in the uh, not-too-distant future. Pete, I really appreciate the opportunity to speak with you.
Well, hopefully you enjoyed that conversation as much as I did. And yeah, I talked about it a little bit uh, during the interview, but I've been reading Martin's work, or Marty, as he's called. Uh, I've been reading Marty's work for a number of years. You know, I, I've done some writing. I've written a few articles on high-intensity training. I wrote um, a workshop for the American Council on Exercise on high-intensity training and metabolic conditioning. And I really, I really, if you want to learn more about this and, and you, you don't have a strong background in exercise science, I really recommend that you look at the one-minute workout. I have a link to it down below in the show notes. And just a side note, I'm not sophisticated enough yet. I haven't set up an Amazon page so that people can buy the books I'm referring. Through an Amazon page, I know that uh, that can help generate some revenue. Haven't done that yet. So the stuff I'm referring you to is because I believe it's good information. And when I try to have people on the podcast, I want to go to the source, the people that are doing the, the work, whether researchers or practitioners, the people that are doing a work that are making a difference. And so it really is interesting. One of the things I liked about uh, Marty's book, The One Minute Workout, is it kind of walks through the history of interval training. And we talked a little bit about that in the podcast. But interval training has been around for years, for decades. And, you know, it's become popular in the last few years because it produces results. But in the re- one of the main reasons why I want to have Marty on, besides the fact he's one of the main researchers in the field, is, is I want to get the message out there that you don't need to do a tremendous amount of high-intensity interval training to get the benefits. Yeah, I've worked in commercial gyms for almost 20 years, and I find it very interesting that when you look at professional athletes, professional athletes have very structured regimen training programs. And, and I'll use professional football as an example because professional football only plays one game a week. Those athletes, they do a lot of high-intensity conditioning in the off-season, but when it comes to in-season, they're doing one, maybe two days a week of high-intensity training, and they're doing a hit. They're not doing a t- tremendous amount of volume. They're not doing it, you know, they're not doing it for hours on end. You know, if a professional football player is doing conditioning during the week, he's probably doing it between 20 and 40 minutes max, but he's doing it in extremely high intensity because that's what we know generates results. And I see people in the gym all the time, especially the past number of years now that HIT's been popular with various class formats, you know, Tabata conditioning, HIT training, whatever you want to call it. You know, I see people do doing three, four, five of those classes a week. And, you know, that's that's way too much, especially if you're over the age of 35, because exercise is physical stress applied to the body. When you're doing HIT training, you're putting a tremendous amount of stress on the body. You're, you're stressing the mitochondria, you're stressing the heart, you're stressing the lungs. You're putting a lot of stress on all the systems in your body. And, you know, imagine if you kept driving your car, driving your car, driving your car, and didn't put oil into the engine. What's going to happen to it? It's going to seize up. Well, if you keep doing high-intensity training, but don't give yourself time to recover, or don't do the proper nutrition, the proper rest, if you don't do the little steps to recover from the work that you're doing, you're going to put way too much stress on your system. And and yes, high-intensity level training is good, and there are a lot of benefits, but doing too much of it fundamentally is not good because it's not necessarily a work. And you've heard me talk about this with a lot of guests. It's not the work that gets you. It's not the work that gets the results. I, I mean, it is, but it isn't. I mean, the work is only part of the equation. It's what you do after your workout that makes a significant difference on whether or not you're going to see the benefits from exercise. So if you do a high-intensity interval workout and then the next day you, you try to go hard again, then you might be able to do it. But you certainly can't do it a third day because it takes time for your muscles to replace the energy it's spent. It takes time for your muscles to repair the damage. Your, your, nerv- your nervous system, your hormones, your endocrine system, there's a lot of repair and replacement that needs to happen. So if you want to do interval training the, the right way or the smart way, I really suggest you follow the guidance of a researcher. You know, as you heard us talk about, he's been looking at, at, at unhealthy populations. He's been looking at sedentary populations. We know that hit tra- work training works for athletes. There's reams of data on that. If you want to, if you want to, you know, really geek yourself out, or if you need a sleep aid, go to Google Scholar, type in high intensity interval training into the search bar, and you're going to get thousands of hits on research. And and again, I want to point out something to you here, and you're going to hear this from all the researchers I speak to. They they can't say definitively that something works. They can look at it at a population, and say, okay, well, we saw this. But we don't know if it's going to work for everybody because everybody's going to have a slightly different reaction. Now, the one thing I can tell you that after picking up and reading the one-minute workout, and I've known this stuff for a while, but 
you know, I'll play around. I'll do steady state training for a while, just keeping it consistent. But for the last six weeks or so, I've been back on high intensity interval training and specifically kind of following the, the format in, in Marty's book. I've been keeping my workouts between eight and maybe 15, 16 minutes long. And that, you know, may include or not include the workout. I've been keeping the working portion of my, my workouts, my metabolic workouts, between about 8 and 15 minutes long. I've been playing around with two different formats, one 30-30, where I go as hard as I can for 30 seconds, and then I go easy for 30 seconds. And when I do that, I try to do it, I use a Stairfit, Air, uh, I'm sorry, a Stairmaster Airfit bike. The Stairmaster Airfoot is, uses the arms and the legs. It has that, it's a movable handles. But the most important thing is it has a wattage, you know, you can see your wattage on there. Because I want to keep all my work intervals at about the same wattage. And wattage measures power. Or I use a row ergometer. Same thing, I want to measure my power. Because when I do a work interval, I want to make sure I'm doing it at the same intensity repeatedly. So when, when if I don't have much time, or what I've been doing is, I've been doing 30 seconds really hard and 30 seconds easy for maybe, you know, 6 to 8 cycles for 6 to 8 minutes total. And then what I'll do is I'll do a 30, 20, 10. You know, 30 seconds easy, 20 seconds moderate, 10 seconds really hard. If you use a scale of 1 to 10, on a 30-30, my hard work interval is between an 8 and a 10. My recovery is interval between a 4 and a 5, with 10 being the hardest. And on the 30-20-10, I'll do about a 5, a 7, and then a 10 for 30-20-10 seconds. And, and what I've been noticing is on my weekly mountain bike ride, I try to get out on my mountain bike one or two times a week. What I've been noticing is I seem to have more horsepower. And I recover quicker when I get to the top of a hill. Right now, I'm, I'm just there's a there's a hill behind my house, close to where I drop my kids off from school. It's you know, maybe four or five kilometers to the top, but it takes me about 40 minutes to get to the top of the hill, going through the trails. And what I've noticed is that my heart rate's a little bit lower. I have a little more gas in the tank, and I have a little more horsepower for hill climbing. Now that's just a population of one, but I want to see if keeping my workouts relatively short but extremely intense has an effect. And so far, I'm noticing it. And I'm not one of these people that really focus on weight loss. I, I don't care. You know, if you, if you ever see me, you'll know, you know, I'm not Johnny Sixpack. I'm not a slim guy. I, you know, I played defensive lineman. And, well, let me, let me rephrase that. When I was on the football team, <laughs> I was on the scout team, and I was a defensive lineman on the scout team in college. I was a front row rugby player, prop hooker. So I'm a stout guy. So when I train, I don't train for physique. I don't train for appearance. I train for performance. And that really is what I pay attention to. So if you're looking for a type of training that's going to produce results, whether you want to do it for performance or, let's face it, appearance is a lot of nutrition intake based. But if you're looking for an effective way to train that's really going to help you get the most results in a minimum amount of time, I really recommend high-intensity interval training, but pick up Marty's book. You know, you'll find that you only need to do two, three workouts a week and keeping the workouts relatively short. It's not the duration, it's the intensity. So it was really a pleasure to have him, you know, to have him on. And, and he's somebody I've been, you know, as I mentioned, I've been reading his stuff for years. So it really is kind of fun to listen to him and, and, and just pick his brain a little bit. And, you know, selfishly, and I'll be 100% honest here, one of the reasons why I do this podcast is I want to have a chance to talk to these folks, to learn more about them. And with every conversation I'm having, and I've been doing this for years, you know, and I have a master's degree in the field. With every conversation I'm having, I'm loving it because I'm geek out. I get to geek out on exercise science. So this is really, really a lot of fun for me. Anyway, that's it for today's um, episode or for this episode with Marty Gabala. I really recommend I have his link in the show notes. Again, I'm not getting anything from it. I, just, I want you to get a good resource to help you get the most from your time spent sweating. And the cool thing, too. What well, we're seeing, last thing, and, and I, I can't believe I forgot this. The most important thing is that it can help you delay the aging process because high-intensity interval training can help increase mitochondrial density. And mitochondria are the structures of the cell that use oxygen that help it become more effective. So you don't need to kill yourself with you know hour, hour and a half long workouts to slow down the aging process. 20 to 30 minute workouts of high intensity, you know, doing the right interval structure can not only provide health benefits and performance benefits, but it can produce the anabolic hormones, you know, that can help you stay younger and it can help increase mitochondrial density. And it can also give you a healthier heart and, and, you know, keep things like onset diabetes from happening. So, so why not look at doing it correctly? You know, why not look at, at, at picking up a book, picking up a resource 
to help you maximize it. Well, wrapping this up, I hope you got a lot of the episode. I, it's A lot of things have been happening with the podcast. I'm going to have a couple sponsors I'll be launching in the new year, 2018. I try not to date these uh, these recordings, but as I go forward, I'm really, I'm really excited. That I'm getting some great traction. If you're listening regularly, thank you very much. If you have any ideas for shows or if you, you know, have a pit, guest pitch you want to do, email me, please, Pete at PeteMcCallFitness.com. Or if you want me to answer a fitness-related question on an upcoming quick fit tip, please email me, send it to me. You can find me on Twitter. My Twitter handle is PeteMC underscore fitness. My Instagram tag is Pete McCall underscore fitness. I try to put relevant information up on those channels, just trying to help you live a healthier, more productive life, and most importantly, help you learn how to use exercise to slow down the aging process. Because none of us are getting younger, but we can manage how, how aging affects us, and we can use exercise to give us the ability to do what we want to do when we want to do it. So thanks for tuning in. If you like this, if you like the podcast, please take a moment, give me a good rating, help others find it. I'd really appreciate it. Thanks for stopping by All About Fitness. I'm Pete McCall, and I look forward to having you tune in for future episodes.